I'm here with Adrian Eidelman. He is the co-founder of RSK Labs. So we had RSK on the podcast about five years ago. So it's been a really long time. And I'm sure that most of you probably don't remember that episode. Uh, some of you probably weren't even listening back then. But um, nonetheless, we we're excited to have uh, RSK on again because there's lots have been happening um, in the RSK sort of you know, ecosystem. And also, I think like it's we often cover projects in the smart contract uh, platform space that are like, like around uh, building on Ethereum or like building on you know, newer uh, blockchain platforms. And there's only you know, so many projects that are trying to do this sort of like scalable smart contract platform on top of Bitcoin. Of course, we had Stacks on just recently and RSK is uh, one of those projects that's been around for a long time. Um, so we're going to be speaking with Adrian today about uh, the vision for RSK, what has been going on in the project for the last for the last five years since we last had them on, and we'll also get into the technology. So, Adrian, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. So it's been about five years, like I said. You know, we had Sergio Lerner um, on about five years ago. So, what's been the the journey for RSK since? Um, since then, like, how has the project evolved? And you know, maybe tell us a little bit about the organization that um, that acquired RSK Labs and sort of what that means for the project. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, actually five years ago is more or less the time when we started uh, to build RSK. So uh, definitely a, a lot of things have happened uh, since then, uh, not only in RSK, but the whole crypto space for sure and yeah well basically uh, we, we when we started working five years ago with the vision of uh, building on, on top of Bitcoin as you said and basically bringing smart contracts to Bitcoin uh, that was our main uh, goal at the beginning of the project in 2016 and well basically uh, uh, the, the, the after after that uh, we put our heads down in, in building the, the basic uh, building blocks of, of the RSK uh, platform, of the RSK sidechain. And we uh, launched the mainnet in early 2018. So uh, uh, RSK, uh, also uh, commonly known as Rootstock, uh, was launched uh, three years ago and it's been uh, in mainnet uh working uh, since then right and we are still working on on, on rsk there's a, a, a lot of stuff to do and the ecosystem have has grown a lot and there are other um, very important players contributing to the yeah to the platform and to the ecosystem and yeah we have also uh started working on different layers on top of rsk uh, all of them looking for building more decentralized uh, technologies for for other projects or other entrepreneurs to 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 build decentralized uh, applications on top of Bitcoin, right? People who've been in the space long enough will remember that you know back around 2014, 2015, you know there was um, there were like a few projects that were trying to build on top of Bitcoin and like one that I remember and uh, that I think a lot of people from back then remember was, was Counterparty. Um, and then like RSK, I think had like a very different vision and approach. So like Counterparty was trying to build like a token system essentially using um, like Bitcoin op returns. And so like it had to parse the entire blockchain and like that, that didn't, you know, there were some early projects that were trying to use that and it, you know, didn't really play out. Of course there was colored coins as well. And like, RSK had more like broader ambitions to build a smart contract platform um, on top of Bitcoin. You know, early on, like where did you see that RSK could bring value compared to some of these other projects that were trying to like build platforms up on top of Bitcoin? And like, what was the long term vision here? Back in in two thousand and fifteen, and and probably even before that. Uh, some, uh, well, you mentioned Sergio, he, he was already working on this idea of smart contracts and, and the idea of a Turing complete uh, virtual machine that like, it's much richer uh, in terms of the possibilities that it gives to, to developers and, 
and yeah, and people developing on top of uh, this uh, of the smart contracts platform. So uh, back then, uh, of course, in 2015, we had the Ethereum launch, and like the the yeah, the richness of the um, of the possibilities for developers were much much uh, broader and much more powerful than than the, the projects you mentioned before. So uh, yeah, we 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 like that approach, but we had the vision at that time that uh, this uh, had to be built on top of Bitcoin, right? Because uh, Bitcoin, well, also five years ago, it's not now probably much more clear but it was uh, already uh, the most secure platform. It has uh, several years uh, working uh, with no big uh, issues. So uh, although we loved what Ethereum was proposing back then, uh, we were sure that that had to be built on top of Bitcoin, right? So that's why we envisioned this idea of building uh, a sidechain, right? So um, RSK is basically a smart contracts platform. It works similar to what Ethereum is. However, uh, you need Bitcoin to transact. You need Bitcoin to pay for the transaction fees, to uh, deploy a contract, to execute a contract, to transfer uh, native tokens. Yeah, I, I think that was uh, the key in, in, in the vision we had and probably different from the approaches you, you mentioned before uh, and, and thinking about the independent blockchain where you need Bitcoin to transact. And that I, we, we think it's like the, one of the best ways to have Bitcoin evolve, right? Um, and, and, and the vision in, in we had in mind was basically uh, about building a, a more inclusive uh, financial system. Now it's like probably uh, more uh, uh, common to, to in terms of how the DeFi movement evolved, but by back back then, without using the, the term DeFi or open finance, we were already thinking about this idea of decentralizing the financial system, especially uh, coming from like Latin America, where that need it's uh, so like clear and visible to anyone living here. But we 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 knew at that moment that uh, we needed like technologies that could enable uh, developers to build, as I said, like uh, more more uh, richer yeah solutions, and and that's where we kind of try to bring together this idea of smart contracts and Ethereum and building on Bitcoin, and that's where we uh, started working on on RSK, but but always with the vision of of making a, a more decentralized financial system. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that uh, permeates through my conversations with people who are either from or have lived or worked in Latin America uh, is that, you know, there's a, there's really like a visible need, a tangible need um, to, you know, to build and work on these systems. And I think like the most recent conversation that I had with Camille Russo, you know, she, she talks about this in her book and she also talked about it during the podcast is like, you know, one day she could, you know, trade um, her her Argentinian pesos for for dollars, and then the next day she couldn't. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And this is yeah. Like and actually, uh, yeah, it's hard for for, for people here, uh, like have, having to deal with all these like uh, limitations, as you said. Not only being able to get access uh, to, as Camila said, American dollars, because the Argentine peso is like. Uh, it's uh, there is an inflation uh, of twenty percent to fifty uh, percent every year uh, for the last fifteen years. So uh, basically, you get uh, pesos, and you need to uh, act quickly before they get depreciated, right? Uh, so um, that's why there is a big community here in Latin America around Bitcoin because it's been a way for people to escape or minimize these uh, obstacles they have had or, and they actually have today. And, and that's why, like, uh, and, and many people, even without access to any financial service, like uh, to a bank account, to the possibility of, of uh, having their money 
uh, safe in a bank account. And I mean, it's like a very basic needs that uh, even here uh, we, we usually uh, don't see, but if you like open your eyes a bit, you will uh, see it clearly that Bitcoin and all these uh, decentralized technology play a, a very important role in, in, in making a, a more decentralized and, and freer world. Yeah. And in, in the last five years, you know, since, since you guys have been working on RSK, have you been able to you know, observe um, some like tangible benefits that uh, you know, people in your surroundings, like in Argentina, and are like you're also like living in Uruguay now. Have have you been able to observe tangible improvements that Bitcoin and just generally, you know, decentralized technologies with you know Ether, Ethereum, whatever, have been able to bring to people's lives? Like, has you seen like sort of tangible benefits um, to people, perhaps like outside the crypto space? You know, like the non crypto nerds. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's we we still in, in early stages of this. Like saying that it has changed the world, the the life of of a significant amount of people. I, I I wouldn't say that's that's true. Maybe it's where we are going, uh, because when you see all this DeFi movement, which we found like uh, very interesting, uh, still the users are probably not the ones in this. Uh, facing these problems I mentioned before. However, uh, yeah, you, you can see people going to Bitcoin. Uh, you can see people trading Bitcoin probably in slums, in Buenos Aires and other places. Like I, I talk mostly about Latin America because it's where I am and it's where I can see like this more, more clearly. I'm sure this probably happens in other places also. Uh, but yeah, you can see that, you can see people uh, going to stable coins uh, to try to protect their, uh, their money and their value before it gets, as I said, depreciated. It's, I think it's, it's growing a lot. I wouldn't say it's massive yet. People get very creative here about how to escape all these controls and limitations. So uh, yeah, for the last few years, you've seen people go to Bitcoin. And even though it's like, as you know, it's volatile, it's even much better than sticking to like the local currency. Uh, and, and yeah, I think we will see that becoming bigger with, with time, but you can already see that happening. Uh, so uh, yeah, there is a, 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 a big a Bitcoin community in Latin America. And I think it's, it's uh, it's not uh, casual. I mean, it's it's not something that happened because uh, it was something random, but basically because of all this um, re or the reality that people face here. So, uh, but again, I think it's not like something like massive yet. But I think it will. We will see that growing a lot in the following couple of years. Yeah. So let's get into. Um... Let's get into the meat of things here. Let's talk about RSK and we want to like dissect, uh, you know, the technology and all the different uh, aspects of like how RSK works. We want to talk about the peg to Bitcoin. Obviously, RSK uh, leverages merged mining, so we can talk about that. There's uh, there's this unique mechanism called POW peg, which we uh, should also get into. Um, but but first, you, you mentioned earlier the building blocks, uh, the RSK building blocks. Let's let's maybe, you know, for our listeners, like draw a picture of what those building blocks are and how they interact with each other at a high level and then we can kind of like drill down into each of them yeah sure so like uh in a nutshell you the, there are like as you say it's um, a few building blocks that um are uh, the ones that um yeah it's important to to mention to understand rsk right First of all, uh, RSK is a, it's an independent platform. It's not like uh, working using the Bitcoin protocol. It's an independent platform. It's an independent network. It runs its own nodes. And all of these nodes run uh, a client implementation from the, for the RSK protocol, which basically uh, or, or, or mainly runs an uh, EBM compatible 
uh, virtual machine so that it's uh, able to uh, run and execute uh, smart contracts, right? It's, in that sense, it's similar to Ethereum. Uh, but then it, there is a, a couple of strong connections with the Bitcoin network, uh, and that's why we call it a, a sidechain, right? The first one, as I mentioned, is that uh, the a native token for RSK is Bitcoin. There is no uh, other newly minted token or other native token for RSK. And that's basically achieved through a bridge, and usually called a two-way peg, uh, between Bitcoin and RSK. It's the technology that lets users transfer their Bitcoins from Bitcoin to the RSK blockchain so that they can transact and do everything within the smart contracts platform. And of course, they can do the uh, other way around, like taking their Bitcoins on RSK back to Bitcoin and get their Bitcoins back on the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's one of the uh, most critical uh, components and, and, and most important. The other link with, um, with Bitcoin, as you mentioned before, is uh, the, the merge mining, like the, the consensus um, mechanism for RSK, which is basically merge mine with, with Bitcoin. So those two strong connections with Bitcoin, uh, it's what makes uh, RSK in our like, mindset of, of seeing RSK as a whole, as a, a smart contracts layer on top of Bitcoin, right? It's a, we see as Bitcoin as a layer one or layer, layer zero, like a store of value uh, layer. And on top of Bitcoin RSK, where you can get access to all the benefits of a smart contracts uh, platform, as, as we usually know. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I think is important to mention here is that RSK is a, an EVM comp compatible uh, blockchain. So uh, that means people can deploy um, you know, any smart contract that they would have written in Solidity for Ethereum. They can um, deploy on, on EVM. Uh, and then the other interesting thing is that RSK uses Bitcoin as its native currency. So in order to use RSK, pay fees, uh, for instance, you have to move Bitcoin into the platform and, and RSK ach achieves this um, by, um, by a peg, by way of a peg. And we'll, we'll get into the, the peg functionality. But so I'm looking at this diagram here that uh, I think like really kind of sums up um, the the different components of RSK really well. And so, you know, you have people that are using the platform, right? Like what we might call economic actors. And they're interacting with RSK um, primarily, well, at first, I guess, through this bridge contract. So like they would send uh, Bitcoin to the bridge contract and that would allow them to, uh, to get sort of like RSK Bitcoin or, you know, some might call them like wrapped Bitcoin somehow like on the RSK platform and that allows them to uh, interact uh, on the RSK platform. Um, but then there's these other actors. So we have miners um, and miners are participating in a merged mining protocol. Um, then we also have the um, the, the PowPeg uh, nodes and PowPeg nodes are running in HSM and you know, we'll get into the details here, but I think what these nodes are doing are um, holding the Bitcoin that are in the bridge contract. Um, and then we have these armadillo nodes, and it's not so clear to me what the armadillo do nodes are doing, but you know, we can we can get into the details here. So, you know, let's let's unpack this picture and maybe describe how all these participants are uh, working independently and like how they work together to form you know the RSK security model, and then of course like uh, executing smart contracts. Yeah, exactly. So the 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 actors you mentioned are the, the most important ones. Uh, we'll get to Armadillo. It's actually not something like it's more like secondary, but an important component in RSK. Um, but probably no, not like the, the at the at the uh, most important level uh, of understanding what RSK is. So yeah, so we, we ha you mentioned the the mining pools. Yeah, the mining pools uh, are uh, giving like the economic security to, to RSK through merge mining. Uh, basically, uh, merge mining is a technique by which uh, using the same hashing power and using the same hash rate, uh, 
miners can sec secure two blockchains at the same time, right? So uh, basically, by reusing the 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 shares or the or or the jobs that the the actual miners, I mean the the the, the hardware sends to a mining pool, and in our case. Uh, the primary blockchain is Bitcoin, of course, and the secondary blockchain is, is RSK. And yeah, basically these mining pools can, uh, since, since RSK is mined at a lower difficulty than Bitcoin, all these shares that the mining pool receive, because the, the, uh, the actual miners, the hardware, are asked to send uh, shares or jobs at a lower difficulty than it's needed uh, to mine Bitcoin, those shares can also be used uh, to mine uh, RSK. So uh, basically, RSK, as you said, it's a merge mine uh, platform and using a proof of work uh, consensus model, right? So the same, again, the same mining pools mining uh, Bitcoin can mine uh, RSK at the same time with no additional cost and with no impact to, to their Bitcoin mining uh, operations and what basically the, the benefit for them is that they will get bitcoins that come from the transactions fees that are paid on on RSK right currently uh, well it, it goes up and downs but on average in the last couple of months uh, there's been uh, around 60 percent of the Bitcoin hashing power uh, securing the RSK network uh, and I would say that the top Bitcoin mining pools are contributing to, to the platform to, to protect that. So it's, uh, it's, we're like very, very happy to have their support because it's, it's a massive amount of hashing power and, and makes that the smart contract platform like very, very secure in terms of uh, a 51% attack, right? Regarding the, uh, you mentioned the Popeg. And, and, and the signatories of the POPEG. Basically, a POPEG is uh, a name that we've given to the uh, evolution of uh, the RSK two-way peg with Bitcoin, right? So when, when, we, when, when RSK was launched in 2018, of course, there, there was a, a two-way peg uh, available. There, there, there are several ways to achieve a two-way peg, to achieve this bridge uh, mechanism that any sidechain needs to have to transfer Bitcoin back and forth between the two the two chains, right? Basically, we've evolved through different uh, security models, and, and the last one is what we call the POPEG, right? It's uh, the the latest uh, um, security model for the two-way peg. At the beginning, when we uh, when we launched RSK in two thousand and eighteen, the model was different. It was like most uh, mostly like a um, a hybrid SPB federated peg, right? It's basically a federated bridge where there are a set of functionaries that participate in a, in a multi-signatory uh, custody of the, of the assets, in this case of the Bitcoins, right? And we've evolved into this POPEG uh, version where there are, as you, as you mentioned, HSMs involved. And one of the, the characteristics of the POPEG is that uh, these HSMs uh, are doing a proof of work validation of the of the transactions of the commands or the requests that uh, the POA HSMs, as we call it, receive. Right. So this like drastically improves the security, like going from this uh, hybrid SPB federated model, where these uh, federation members have control over the keys that have access to the funds, right? And, and when I say the funds, I mean the Bitcoins that get locked in the Bitcoin blockchain uh, to this new model where the keys are uh, inside this HSM, this hardware security uh, device cannot be uh, taken uh, or access to, to get them out of the device. And basically, uh, this HSM will only execute transactions, peg out transactions, when they are coming from the bridge contract and when they have enough proof of work. And, have, and going back to the merge mining explanation, since there is around 60% of, of, of the Bitcoin hashing power, uh, it's really, really 
uh, safe uh, to have the keys and, and, and the pegouts uh, commanded by, by this HSM. So that's what has changed drastically in terms of security between the original two-way peg in 2018 and now the Paul peg uh, version that we have recently launched. So can, can you maybe go into detail as to how it's more secure because, or maybe, maybe just, uh, it helps just to remind, uh, to give a reminder of like how a federated peg works and then yeah. how the proof of work peg, uh, improves upon it. Cause I'm, I'm not like quite clear there on how that works. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, from, from the user perspective, maybe it's, it's easier to understand from the user perspective. So you have bitcoins that you want to. Uh, move them to RSK, right? To, to uh, have your Bitcoins used in a like DeFi protocol or uh, to build your own uh, smart contracts or wherever you want to do on RSK. So you start by uh, w with the need of having Bitcoins on RSK, right? There are different ways to get uh, Bitcoins on RSK, but the native one is by going through this uh, two-way peg, by going through this bridge. So users, what do is basically send their Bitcoins to a multi-signature in Bitcoin, to a multi-signature address in Bitcoin. And, uh, well, at the end of the process, they, they get Bitcoins on RSK, right? The, the kind of magic that happens between uh, sending your Bitcoins and getting your Bitcoins uh, in RSK, it's what the two-way peg does, right? So... Uh, these uh, bitcoins that are locked in a multi-sig, those keys for the multi-sig are, are controlled. I, I'm talking about the original um, model in 2018. I control by what we call uh, members of the federation, right? They are running a, a, an RSK node with some additional capabilities and, and basically uh, they have control of one of the keys of the multi-signature. And so they play an important role in releasing the Bitcoins when the users want to go back from RSK to Bitcoin, right? So uh, when users want to go back to RSK from Bitcoin, there, well, there is a bridge contract. It's a smart contract living on the RSK blockchain that basically orchestrates all this flow, flow with uh, 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 taking care of uh, validating different things that there are enough confirmations on RSK and there, well, a bunch of validations that need to be done, but when everything is like, uh, okay, they will ask each of these federation members to sign the release transaction, right? And each of these federation members holding a key for that, they will sign it and the Bitcoins will uh, be released. The, the problem with this approach is that basically it's what I have already said, is that each member of the federation has control over this one of the keys of the multi-signature. So uh, in this model, the federation members could collude to get access to the Bitcoins that have been locked, right? So if those uh, funds are lost, then you will not be able to go back uh, to Bitcoin uh, using your Bitcoins on RSK. We, we've evolved that. First of all, we, we get to a stage where we uh, uh, started to use HSMs uh, that was like a couple of years ago. Basically, these uh, signatories uh, moved to uh, secur securitizing the uh, keys inside an HSM, like uh, similar to a uh, hardware, uh, hardware wallet that uh, anyone uses, where uh, it, has, it, it has a secure element. So like it's pretty much safe uh, and, and, and almost impossible to get access to those keys. So that the, the signatories of the federation basically did not have any access to the uh, keys, right? But they could eventually collude uh, to get access to all the HSMs and have uh, access to the funds, right? Because the, that version of the HSM was uh, not that intelligent in terms of it will secure the uh, private keys, but it would sign uh, the transactions anyway. I mean, with, with no additional logic. And finally, we got to uh, the uh, evolution of that model, which is the Pope, right? That uh, basically this federation is replaced by a set of 
what we call a pegnatories, right? Each of them also running uh, an HSM, but this HSM follows the blockchain proof of work consensus, right? So uh, even if the, they collude and get access to all the HSMs, uh, they will not be able to sign uh, any uh, peg out transaction if it doesn't have enough proof of work and if it doesn't come from the bridge, right? So basically it's impossible for them to collude and get access to the funds with this um, new model. So it's, uh, I don't know if that's, uh, it's, it's now clearer, uh, but basically in, in summary, it like describes the evolution we had from the hybrid SPB uh, uh, two-way peg until this version that we call uh, Poe peg, uh, where there is no no way the these signatories can can get access to the funds. Um, so basically, the the role of these signatories is mainly to keep their hardware and their nodes uh, connected and alive at all times. That's uh, their important uh, role here, right? So they can access, uh, so that the payout transactions can be signed. Neither the uh, hybrid SPB version or the HSM uh, version one, now the PowPeg, the signatories play a role in transaction validation or or creating blocks or anything. Like the the role of these uh, members is basically to uh, they participate in the payout uh, uh, workflow, right? Like people wanted to get bitcoins out of their bitcoins on on a risky okay no that makes a lot of sense so just kind of to sum up here like in a federated peg we have participants that are holding uh different uh, parts of a of a key of a multi-sig uh key and um they essentially hold the bitcoin that uh, then gets um you know transformed into bitcoin rsk like they're they're operating the peg um the issue here is that they can collude and there's there's no sort of like layer in between um, the user and that multi-sig. There's no e extra security layer. And uh, it would just necessitate some sort of, of collusion uh, for those Bitcoins to um, to be extracted from the system. However, with a power peg, you, you know, and also like, you know, in the, in the first version, keys could be stored in, in an HSM and they probably were at some point or, you know, like the security of the key uh, is sort of, um, separate from the risk of collusion in in this pow peg uh, mechanism, the pegnatories, as they're called, uh, have this sort of special HSM, and the special HSM protects users from this form of collusion because the HSM not only stores the keys but it also validates it also validates transactions that are coming from the network, so it verifies that a transaction. Uh, has been included in a block, presumably like verifies that it's been, uh, that that block has, uh, that, there's, that there's been like a certain number of blocks since then. Uh, and uh, also it verifies some other things, like it verifies that the tr those transactions are actually coming from the bridge itself. And so that adds an extra layer of security for uh, for users of the system because they, they can trust that DJ these HSMs are in fact executing transactions as they should be. Yeah, no, just one comment. Uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty accurate what you say. Uh, and when when we when we uh, consider the PowPeg as a proof of work uh, base uh, two way peg, it's basically a, a, a peg out command that is requested to the HSMs. It will wait uh, not only for a certain amount of blocks, but also for a certain amount of work accumulated, right? So that's that's very very important. So I wanted to add that. Well, I mean, there's like a few things here, I guess. Like in terms of trust, these HSMs, the, I mean, like they're not your standard HSM, like like that you would find and say like in an AWS stack or something like that. They're like specifically manufactured for uh, for the RS, RSK chain, correct? No, actually, no. When we when we started. The uh, working on HSMs, we our security team like did a, a broad research about the different uh, possibilities of of devices. Uh, even consider the possibility of manufacturing this ourselves. Uh, we consider like all the uh, different hardware wallets available in the market, 
and and basically the uh, we although it's uh, we we have plans to like be more um, I mean to have other devices so that it's like a more multicultural uh, uh, two way peg in terms of the devices that it runs. The HSMs that are run are not like manufactured by ourselves. It's like they are the, the version that is currently uh, running is uh, a ledger device, right? With a special firmware that we we develop, right? So and and I think that's important because Ledger has uh, I mean that their product is it's great. It has a secure element. It's uh, very uh, secure in, in in terms of and of, of protecting the keys. And at the same time, it's uh, I think it's good in terms of security that this is not uh, manufactured by ourselves in terms of uh, minimizing the incentives of a manufacturer uh, supply attack or something like that. I mean, Ledger already is storing billions of dollars in cryptocurrencies. I would think that it's, it, it's not something that uh, would be in the manufacturer mind of uh, doing some kind of supply chain attack. Of course, we, we all, always consider any possibilities, but the fact that these are like uh, devices uh, well known and proved and, and that's uh, already protecting a massive amount of money in cryptocurrencies, I think that's a, a good uh, point and, and strength for this uh, model of, of HSMs. Okay. No, I, that's interesting. I didn't know that it was a ledger device. So in my mind, I was thinking like this is like a rack, <laughs> like a rack device in like some server room. Uh, no, but, no, no, no. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's it's pretty easy. Well, uh, and and yeah, I mean, these pegnatories basically, uh, as I said, are uh, had the the responsibility of uh, running uh, the 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 Popec node, which is an an RSK node with additional capabilities to basically to to be able to, to participate in this workflow. And they basically are running an, a, a ledger device that uh, has all this logic uh, inside of it, right? That's you basically acquire some ledger devices and then you've um, flashed those devices with your own firmware, like firmware that's been, how does that work? Like, I, I, I didn't think that one could just flash a ledger device without having Ledger's signature. Well, uh, yeah, actually it's, um, it's uh it's not that it's flashed and and that's a good point that, that you mentioned because maybe flashing is not the right term here but like no, basically yeah I mean, they, basically they, they, re overriding the firmware yeah yeah it's it's it basically works that way so there is a, a setup uh for the pegnatories to uh and, and secure setup and we are very close to also releasing the attestation firmware that, so that anyone will be able in the community, in RSK, anyone willing to uh, validate that uh, the, uh, the, the signatures of the pegnatories are coming from a device, from a, an HSM, from an original ledger device, and that it's running uh, a well-known uh, uh, firmware, which is like a software uh, code, uh, like any, any other program. Uh, can can validate and verify that. That's very important for us uh, to give transparency uh, on this. But going back to your question, yeah, basically the, the pegnatories can get a ledger uh, and, and, and I think that's also good. It's not something that uh, we are, as I said, manufacturing and providing uh, to them and they don't know what's inside. They can validate that. And yeah, there is a, basically a process, a secure process or, or ceremony, uh, as we usually say, where this uh, uh, firmware is updated. Basically, the signer is updated with it, all this logic I, I mentioned before. Right. I'm trying to like break this, see where I can break this apart if, if, if I can at all, but uh, it, couldn't all of the pegnatories collude to write their own firmware and then all of them together having the same firmware essentially like bypassing this the security of like validating uh that there's been enough proof of work and like you know could, couldn't they just store the keys kind of on the hsm and then um or, or somehow bypass that security or is there something in the bridge contract that's that where there's also like some dependency there for for the verification yeah yeah short answer is no they cannot do that 
They cannot do that. I mean, they could eventually uh, change the firmware, but that will make them basically uh, not be able to participate in the in the protocol itself, right? And that's because there's some external, like the bridge contract or some other uh, component is verifying the framework or the, yeah, the framework? Yeah, it's ver verifying the, the, the signatures. If they change that, everything will change and they will not be able to participate. Yeah, so uh, basically, basically they will be automatically out of the system, right? Okay, yeah. I guess the, the, the hardware was one of the things that, you know, going into this, I was um, where I was most concerned with, but it seems that, you guys are relying on third-party hardware manufacturers and you know perhaps at some point like i don't know if this is the case but you could you could imagine like having trezor or like some other uh hsm manufacturer also being supported and so then it's like you know you you basically have this you know you can use yeah. any commoditized hardware to to do this as long as you're running the you know a compatible version of the firmware uh, absolutely there are ways to improve that it would be uh, good, I think, to have other devices. And we have plans for that. In, and, and I would say if you want to like uh, be, and I think it's important that we improve the security as much as we can. And we have like a roadmap for this uh, to continually improve this uh, PO uh, PEG uh, system. But we, can, we have even uh, thought about having the, like the PEG notorious or proposing the communities, of course, to uh, run two devices, right? So it it would like give like a, a backup uh, uh, mechanism in case uh, anything fails. But uh, I would say that currently this two-way peg system is the most secure that has ever existed. So we are we are very proud of it. So so the only real like risk that one faces here, I guess, is is like a denial of service attack or a situation or like all the pegnatories. Uh, being down or mm -hmm. like that's and then and then the risk there is that the bridge wouldn't work but mm -hmm. you know this wouldn't affect people's bitcoin like basically it would just it would just render the bridge unable to to function but it wouldn't affect people's funds well uh actually what th that's that's an interesting point basically uh what would happen if the majority of the pegnatories turn their like uh, notes off, right? That's uh, what you're saying. What basically happens there is that users will not be able to... Uh, so that the pegout commands will not be executed. You will not be able to get bitcoins from your bitcoins on RSK, right? So everything in RSK will continue working uh, exactly the same. You will also be able to do peg-ins, so you, to get Bitcoins in RSK uh, using your Bitcoins, but there will not be uh, enough pegnatories to issue or to sign the peg-out transactions and get your, your, your Bitcoins back. That's what it will not work. That's not something, although a lot of other things will con continue working, it's a critical component of the, of the workflow. There are like things we are, uh, of course, all the time, our research team is thinking about that. The, the, the first uh, solution or the short-term solution for that, it's basically what we call a time lock emergency uh, recovery, right? It's similar to what Liquid has. Uh, in short, uh, if uh, Bitcoins, uh, and, and this is coming, this is coming the next network upgrade for, for RSK, which is Iris, and expected to, 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 to be released uh, probably, most probably during April. And basically what that means is that the funds are, uh, are not uh, moved for a certain amount of time, let's say one year, it's, it's how it's, it, it's working in, in, in Iris, then uh, those funds will be, be available for a set of, uh, of a fallback pegnatories to, uh, to move, right? So in that case, they would recover the funds and, uh, and basically uh, get them back uh, to the users. But it's true that that would happen only after one year of the funds not being uh, used, right? It's mm. like a, 
an a, a emergency procedure uh, that uh, can uh, like a kind of escape hatch for that situation, but it takes time for those funds to be to be available, right? So that's a, like a, a, a edge case that it needs to be considered. So it's a good point you were mentioning here. No, this is uh, this is interesting. I I, uh, I I feel like I get the the the, the power peg mechanism a lot better now. Um, and so, what are armadillos? And <laughs> what do they have to do? Well, uh, yeah, uh, armadillo. How do they interact uh, here? Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, technology we've developed lately. It's basically uh, a, a suit of tools that are designed uh, to uh, protect the, the aeroscape blockchain from uh, merge mining attacks, basically, right? It's like an alert system uh, or monitor system. And, and basically its role is to, to ensure that, that the, the merge mining works as expected, like to, to say uh, clear. So basically- So what, the, are the, the, what are the attacks that, that can occur in merge mining that we're talking about here? Yeah, well, basically, it's, uh, the, the attack in this case would be an RSK fork, right? So, uh, uh, so uh, a, a significant amount of hashing power doing merge mining, uh, basically uh, building a, an RSK fork and then uh, reverting the blockchain and, and doing probably a double spend attack or something like that. I mean, other blockchains have suffered from this, especially Ethereum Classic lately. Uh, because uh, also their, their hashing power was quite low. And in the case of Iris case, it's, as I said, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's high, around 60% or even more of the hashing power. But we need to consider the possibility of the attack coming from the same miners that are doing merge mining, right? So what basically, in, in a nutshell, what Armadillo does is, like, it's able to monitor this by uh, inspecting the Bitcoin uh, merge mining tags, right? So basically it's looking into the Bitcoin merge mining tags to see if the uh, blocks that should be uh, mining RSK uh, from, from the ones that have been mining Bitcoin are being like uh, actually mined, are being sent and that they are not being like kept uh, by a single miner or a set of miners. And if that happens, it can trigger alerts or even uh, maybe uh, stall certain operations to avoid a, a double spend attack. That's, that's in, in a nutshell what, what Armadillo does. It's based on the assumption that this attack uh, comes from miners that do, do not want to lose the possibility of mining Bitcoins, right? Because the attack would be like uh, really, really expensive if they don't do that, right? Uh, so that's basically it. But yeah, it's it's uh, more than armadillo notes. It's like a, as I said, a suit of tools or a monitoring system to protect from from that kind of attacks. So so armadillo monitor is is, is not like uh, they're they're not nodes, um, so to speak. But when you say it's a set of tools, like what form does it take? Is it something that you guys are running or? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, actually it's, uh, I, well, probably you can say nodes. Yeah, it's uh, like this technology that we are now running from IOB. It's not like it's running an Armadillo node. It's not part of the economic uh, incentives of the, of the platform. It's not that you, at least for now, it's not that you, by running an Armadillo uh, monitor, you get rewarded or things like that, which I, I think it's, it's where you, you, you were probably... Uh, trying to uh, to understand, yeah. mm. it's, so, it's not part of the of the incentives of the network. What what happens then when a fork is detected, and what kind of mechanisms are in place to mitigate that event? In in in, a, in that scenario, I would say that there are two main things that you need to protect. One of one of one one is the two way pair, basically uh, delay the peg out transactions until the, the situation is safer to resume operations, right? So it, it doesn't mean that uh, basically the, the, the two-way peg will keep the request, but wait for, for, uh, for the uh, emergency to, uh, to be finished in order to continue processing the peg outs, right? 
And, and the other uh, aspect that you need to protect is basically exchanges, right? Because it's probably an attack uh, that can uh, make someone like get out or, or, or exchange their Bitcoins on our escape for Bitcoins so that when they revert the blockchain, they get their Bitcoins on our escape back, like a traditional like double spend attack, right? So it's important that exchanges uh, get notified that, uh, about this situation, that they probably hold the trading for a certain amount of time in protection if they, I mean, it's like what we, we do is like basically raise the alarms, right? It's, this is happening. And of course, it's, it's up to them to decide what to do. But basically, that's why I say it's a monitoring system. It, we are like basically uh, raising an alarm and say, this is a situation where you may want to uh, basically delay uh, or add more confirmations to uh, withdrawals of Bitcoins on RSK. And so does this sort of thing happen often or like, is this an, an attack no. that is, no? No, it, it hasn't happened. It hasn't, I'm, hasn't I'm not, happened. I'm not like super familiar with like merge mining and, and the types of attacks that, that can happen there. And so I feel like this is a, an area that where it's, it's a little bit blurry for me about like, yeah, no, no, you know, how it often hasn't these happened. kind of forks can happen. No, no, it's not common. It hasn't happened in RSK, but we've seen that happen in other blockchains. So uh, basically, we want to be prepared for those possibilities. I, I, if you ask me, I, I, probably it's not like something very uh, usual, but if that happens, it can be a big headache. So we want to be protected and protect the, 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 that the protocol, protect the user funds, right? Uh, regarding merge mining, like a, like a, maybe this will help you understand that when you do merge mining, the Bitcoin blocks contain a, 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 a merge mine tag that basically includes a hash. Uh, there is a, a hash of the of a, of a block in in in, in RSK. I mean, there is a a, a link in the Bitcoin it, uh, block itself with a link to to RSK. So. Basically, uh, 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 that way, by monitoring that, you can detect if a miner is uh, basically contributing with blocks to the Bitcoin uh, blockchain, but not contributing to RSK. Like it's mining RSK blocks, but it's like uh, uh, keeping that them for for themselves. So that probably doesn't look good. It's probably a sign of a, of a possible like. Uh, reversion of the blockchain if it suddenly sends a lot of blocks and the blockchain gets reverted. So that's, I don't know if that uh, clarifies a bit. Yeah, but, that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's basically based on monitoring the Bitcoin blockchain and uh, the merge mining tags for RSK. So let's talk a little bit about the um, the EVM here and what, what kind of interoperability does that provide RSK with Ethereum and you know, I know this doesn't exist now, but you know, could there be um, a sort of a peg on the other side um, where you you could have like wrapped ether on RSK or like in the other direction having RSK tokens like or sort of like a wrapped Bitcoin version like of our like an RSK version of wrapped Bitcoin getting sent into um, into Ethereum. Okay, yeah. Um, so regarding the EVM, RSK VM is uh, fully compatible with the EVM. Actually, the, the RSK client uh, comes from a fork from a, a, an Ethereum client. Uh, of course, that was long ago and we've diverted from that. But basically, the, the VM, it's, uh, the, the RSK VM is a fork of the Ethereum VM, right? So one of the things that we, uh, we of course, have to uh, work on is on uh, keeping that compatibility. I mean, if uh, there is new opcodes or native or uh, pre-compiled contracts in Ethereum, we take care of, yeah, of implementing them in, in RSK so that we keep that uh, compatibility. But uh, that makes the BM uh, fully compatible in terms of the operations that the VM can run. And of course, we have uh, also taken care of uh, being compatible at the interface level. I mean, the, the, the way you can interact with an Ethereum node 
uh, it's uh, the same way you can interact with a RSK node. So that's basically uh, let uh, developers to use the same tool chain, the same developer uh, tools, and so moving or, or, or running your uh, application or your dApps in Ethereum in, 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 in Rootstock in, in RSK is pretty uh, straightforward, right? Uh, so any Solidity contract can run on RSK. So MetaMask, you know, like uh, Truffle, all these tools are compatible. Yeah, hard hat. Uh, uh, as long as we take care of uh, uh, of implementing the things that Ethereum is implementing, and that's something that we we do all the time, uh, we keep that compatibility uh, in at the at the VM level and at the interface level also. So it's easy. It's really easy for developers and, and, and the companies working on, on Ethereum to run their their uh, solutions on RSK uh, like seamlessly. Yeah. Speaking of developers, um, what, what are people? Let, let's talk a little bit about sort of the ecosystem and like what are people building on RSK and like how big is that ecosystem uh, today? The, the ecosystem is, is um, evolving a lot lately. Um, there are like very interesting projects uh, that are being built on, on, on RSK, all of them with the mindset of building on Bitcoin, right? Because that's probably the most important value proposition for RSK is that it's building on Bitcoin and, and building this uh, DeFi uh, ecosystem on Bitcoin. So. Uh, we have a, a lot of interesting projects, uh, to name a few. Uh, we have Money on Chain. It's a, it's a Bitcoin collateralized uh, stablecoin. They, they have different tokens, uh, but basically uh, based on, on, on having a, a leverage on, 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 on Bitcoins and getting some additional revenue from, for, for your Bitcoins. But the, the, the main, the main uh, product they have is the uh, uh, dollar on chain, which, as I said, it's a, a USD stable coin backed by Bitcoin. So it's, it's really, really interesting and a, a great team behind that. Uh, Sovereign, uh, it's a very interesting uh, project. It's a lending and, and margin trading uh, platform running on RSK, also a, a Bitcoiners uh, wanted to uh, build these solutions on top of Bitcoin. There are uh, other lending uh, solutions coming soon. Now lending, there are decentralized exchanges like uh, RSK Swap, similar to Uniswap, where you can trade tokens on RSK. There is a marketplace, people from uh, crypto markets. I don't want to forget anyone, collectibles uh, uh, with, with Watafan uh, and, and uh, wallets uh, like Defiant. Uh, a lot of wallets implementing RSK. I mean, it's 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 we're very happy because we've seen this growing a lot lately uh, around this idea of building on Bitcoin and building DeFi solutions uh, for Bitcoin. What what is what we want to 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 achieve right from from in this case from IOB Labs, like providing these technologies for these uh, amazing companies to to build their their. They are companies, they are uh, yeah, businesses on top of RSK and on top of Bitcoin. No, that's cool. I mean, like, it's cool that there are sort of the basic building blocks, it seems like, like building blocks to growing a DeFi ecosystem, ecosystem on top of RSK. So you mentioned like uh, lending, like a swapping mechanism, a stable coin. And these are all the types, of, like these are basically the, the building blocks that you know, um, have been built on Ethereum over the last couple of years. And, you know, from there, like all of the ecosystem kind of built there. Um, you know, I, I'd like to, I'd like to maybe take a step back a little bit and ask you about, does Bitcoin in your view in the future play a significant role in securing, you know, some uh, DeFi ecosystem? I don't know what the market cap of like RSK, the RSK DeFi market is today. I, I think I think I saw somewhere it was like around 300 million or... Uh, to be honest, I, I don't have that, that number in, in my head. Yeah. I, okay. I mean, I, I recall like looking this up maybe like a month or two ago and it was like somewhere around that amount. So that, that pales in comparison to like the, the DeFi ecosystem on, on Ethereum. 
you know, do you expect that to continue to grow to become something that is, you know, big enough to attract investors and projects and to essentially create like a, a decent sized ecosystem there? Um, and what do you think is necessary for that to happen? Yeah, so mo most of the DeFi, of, of course, movement has been built on top of Ethereum so far. Uh, they have done a great job in building this community and this ecosystem and all the, the network effect that they have achieved. It's, it's something that I find, yeah, I, I think they've done a great job and, and, and I think it's, it's fair to recognize that. And uh, probably coming from the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem, maybe I guess that until recently, probably a, a, a significant part of the Bitcoin ecosystem have like not been at paying attention to this DeFi uh, movement. I mean, uh, Ethereum has been uh, live for several years now, and uh, I would say uh, that the DeFi movement it's like the most interesting things we've seen so far. It's been quite recently, and when that took off it was not that easy to build that stuff on top of Bitcoin. Although there is like a, a huge community of Bitcoiners that are willing to uh, basically to have access to these uh, protocols with their Bitcoins. And that's, I think, uh, going back to your question, I think that will definitely happen. Yeah, based on the vision we had initially of this needs to be built on Bitcoin, because it's uh, the most secure and it's the most uh, uh, stable platform and decentralized platform. So it makes sense for us to build this on Bitcoin, right? And now the tools are available. It's, I think, yeah, we will see, uh, apart from all these uh, uh, projects I mentioned before, we will start seeing uh, a lot of uh, of other ones building on top of Bitcoin, hopefully on RSK, but hopefully we will see uh, other uh, Bitcoin side chains building on top of Bitcoin. And I think that's something that it's good and it's something that will definitely happen. Uh, and, and the evolution of Bitcoin uh, will happen in, in, in technologies like RSK, you know, that uh, Bitcoin, it's uh, intentionally, uh, the development of, of Bitcoin is intentionally careful and it's intentionally slow. So it's good to, to, to have, and, and that's great. I mean, it's a uh, it's strength of, of, of Bitcoin. And uh, as long as the layers about Bitcoin, like, like RSK, give enough security and give enough transparency and are decentralized enough, uh, I, I, I'm sure this will definitely happen uh, on Bitcoin and then we will see like a, a, a strong DeFi ecosystem built on, on Bitcoin, I'm, I'm for sure. Yeah, I mean, like there's just so much capital there and, you know, some of it have, has moved over into Ethereum, you know, through like some form of wrapped Bitcoin. There's, there's a lot of capital like that's kind of locked there in, in Bitcoin and isn't being allocated in, in any meaningful way. Um, you know, and I think it would be great to see all of that start funding things and actually creating value. And I think like a lot of people um, who are, you know, who are early into Bitcoin and, and have Bitcoin and want, are, and are long Bitcoin, you know, probably want to have opportunity, probably would like more opportunities to uh, to be able to you know, invest um, in in projects. I mean, like myself included, I mean, like so uh, as someone who you know, holds Bitcoin, um, I've been reluctant to move that Bitcoin into uh, Ethereum. I mean, it's just because like this whole like wrap Bitcoin thing, I'm like it's not super comfortable with it, you know, like. I'm not extremely comfortable with like doing the wrap Bitcoin thing. Also, there's like high fees there. Um, and so, yeah, it's not being allocated towards anything meaningful. It's just hodling and like, it yeah, would be yeah, great to have that sort of uh, ability. Absolutely. And these, these uh, projects, as I mentioned, Money and Chain, Sovereign, 
uh, they have that vision in mind. I mean, it's uh, uh, these are protocols for Bitcoiners to use their Bitcoins. And yeah, it's uh, like, uh, and, and incentives are better aligned in terms of having your Bitcoins on RSK, where the token, the native token is Bitcoin, where the incentives uh, to the miners are paid in Bitcoin. So, uh, but yeah, but you know, still like a, a lot of things to do to see that like massively happening, but we, we starting to, to see that happening and and yes, I said before, I'm 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 sure this will we will see this like getting larger uh, in the in the upcoming couple of years. Absolutely. Cool. So, where can people go to find out more about RSK and like you know what is your call to our listeners? You know what uh, what would you like our our listeners to do in terms of engaging with RSK? Is it like building on RSK? Uh, is it you know deploying their like Ethereum DApps on RSK? Like, what what's the goal like for for yeah? For so uh, uh, yeah, I, I I mean for for developers uh, as as I said before, uh, it's really easy uh, to build on RSK. You, you will uh, be able to use the same skills and same knowledge and the same tools you you, you use if you're all, uh, currently building on Ethereum uh, and. And well, in, 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 and at the same time, uh, with uh, transaction fees that are significantly much lower. And, um, but I would say that uh, uh, it would be great for like uh, other companies and other projects to, to, to build on RSK and build on Bitcoin. And, and yeah, of course, we are uh, from IOB Labs, of course, we are here to help uh, we have uh, our developers portal in its developers.rsk.co uh, the the um, there is an open slack for anyone that wants to uh, know more about the, the the platform or ask any question it's open uh, hyphen rsk hyphen dev of course uh, all this is open source uh, you can get access to the uh, all the projects in RSK and in uh, other technologies like RSK infrastructure framework and everything is in uh, github.com slash RSK smart. There is uh, an open forum uh, to discuss community things, which is research.rsk.dev. Uh, and well, that's the uh, most important thing. I mean, we are like really looking to have uh, more people develop on RSK technologies. We are helping them, uh, their grants and, and, and other uh, um, opportunities uh, to get incentives for doing this. So uh, yeah, several ways to reach, to reach out and we, we will be uh, here to help. Great, well, Adrian, thanks for joining me today. It was great to, uh to connect with the RSK project again. And I'm looking forward to the day where, you know, there's a, a massively thriving ecosystem of uh, apps and projects and um, and lending protocols and like yield farming and all this kind of stuff happening uh, on Auto Bitcoin. I think it would be like really beneficial for, for the ecosystem as a whole. And since there's just so much capital there, it would uh, give, you know, this possibility for, uh, for like an even larger uh ecosystem and you know coming coming from bitcoin i think like there's some unique things about that community and like origins about of, of bitcoin that would like you know shape shape it in in ways that are like different from the way things happen on ethereum so excellent yeah absolutely and thanks for having us uh it's a pleasure to to be here because it's a it's a great uh learning uh podcast for for everyone so thanks and, and congratulations Thank you.